hello everyone. Welcome to World at War Comics. My special guest is Mr. W. Maxwell Prince, um, writer extraordinaire, creator extraordinaire, um, man, ice cream man. I mean, I when you created Ice Cream Man, I'm just gonna jump right in if that's okay. When you created, did sure. you did you think it was gonna be as big as it has become? No, we uh we were planning on it being uh an almost instant failure. Really? Um <laughs> Well, so Martine and I worked on um, a different book uh, that we re-released at Image recently called Art Brute, um, and it was under a different name at IDW many years ago, like 2015 or so, um, and we only got four issues to work together, but by the fourth issue, we were like, oh, we really like working together. What should we do next? And I was like, oh, I've got this weird idea for like, a, it's kind of, you know, sort of interconnected but not interconnected stories held together very loosely by this this figure that's an ice cream man and martin said yes but in like one of those ways where you could tell he was like all right i'm just gonna like you know <laughs> kind of calm this crazy person down and, and yes my way out of the room uh but he committed to the project and we have had a number we're like we're like a cat man we've had a number of lives a number of ups and downs and kind of uh new beginnings and second births and stuff like that so uh issue 38 co comes out i believe in a week or two yep that's incredible man so at 38 so it's over three years you've been going at this now oh even more yeah we i guess first issue came out in 2018 so oh, okay. uh uh, January of 2018. So we're we're looking at, you know, six years of, of publication. We we don't get a solid 12 issues, you know, per year out. Uh, certainly not anymore. Um, I have slowed down quite a bit. Um, <laughs> I have a, uh, Mar Martine has a, a, a toddler and, and then two older daughters. Um, I have a, a seven-year-old. So it's just really hard to like, um, you know, get 12 issues of Ice Cream Man out per year. But we we aim for between six and eight. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're happy with the six or eight. Um, they're pretty incredible. I, I don't oh, know, like, the inspiration for some of these stories, I'm sure you're asked all the time because they're, they're so unique. You know, growing up, uh, you know, I'm almost 50 now. So Twilight Zone was such a big part of my upbringing. I remember sitting with my dad watching that. There's one episode where a young man is driving through like a, a mountain community and he stops into a diner um, to have a, a coffee and then he gets in his car and he drives and he ends up at the diner and he just keeps ending yeah, up. I don't know if you remember that episode, but for whatever reason, that always stayed in my mind and kind of freaked me out that you would be in this loop of life where you can't escape it. Um, and then you just become a regular and wait for the next person to fall into that same cycle where they just can't it get has it, it had the little bobblehead in the booth, right? Yes, that was like the thing. Exactly. Like, uh, yeah. Well, is Twilight um, Zone something that was uh, really dear to you and, and kind of the idea for Ice Cream Man and how you wanted to present some of your stories? It was. So I'm, I mean, I'm 38. So it's not exactly, you know, my, I mean, Twilight Zone is, is evergreen. So if you're paying attention, it's, it's, you know, they do a marathon every July 4th. Uh, every year you can get, you know, the full Twilight Zone experience. But me especially, my, my parents were big fans and they subscribed to this VHS club um, where once a month you would receive in the mail. They were beautifully designed, you know, those big chunky VHS boxes, um, uh, Twilight Zone tapes that each had four to five episodes on them. Um, and we would make a big deal out of sitting down on a Friday night and then usually extended into the Saturday um, to watch the episodes. So I, I've seen almost every episode. And um, I don't know. I mean, my parents are in Florida now. I'm up in New York, but I, I don't know if those tapes still exist somewhere. But um, yeah, Twilight Zone, huge, huge influence on my young brain and how I thought about story and uh, strangeness, and then also presentation, you know, Rod Sterling and the way that he would sort of come in and out and be this figure that was there, but not there. It was a very interesting, the whole thing is packaged just so beautifully. So 
Yeah, no, it definitely comes across. What is the inspiration for some of the stories that you tell? Because they're extremely unique. Um, some of them you sit on, just like Twilight Zone, right? You sit on some of your stories that you've written and you really think about them for a while after you read them because as you're going through them, right, there's some relatability to the story. Um, and then you think that's the end of it. And then like later on, <laughs> you start to think about it again. You're like, holy crap, man, that's a little bit closer to my life maybe than I want it to be. I don't know if you get that a lot. Yeah, I, I unfortunately do. <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm writing, uh, like I think a lot of writers from a very personal space. Um, so, you know, a lot of the narrational thought that you see, uh, especially in Ice Cream Man, is, uh, you know, stuff that I'm wrestling with and, uh, and stuff that I'm thinking about. Not Not necessarily things I believe, but things that, you know, cross my mind, questions that I have. Um, and, uh, but then there are other ones, um, you know, sometimes I'm inspired, I'm challenged by like, uh, I'm inspired by a formal challenge. So I think of like, a, oh, what would be a weird thing to do with a comic? And then that uh, formal challenge will kind of dictate how the story unfolds. So we, um, classically issue 13 was a palindrome. You could read it from first to last panel or last panel to first panel. And it's the exact same story. Um, so that's, you know, you kind of like build a trap to get yourself out of. Um, and then there are other ones like issue three in the very first volume, uh, was, uh, inspired by, uh, an old news article about the, um, lead singer of the Comets, Bill Haley, who did Rock Around the Clock. Um, and it was a really beautiful, beautifully written article called Falling Comet. Um, and it was about Bill Haley toward the end of, end of his life, you know, dealing with alcoholism and drug use and stuff. And the, the most salient kind of image of the article was that he would sit in a diner um, and hum his own song, Rock Around the Clock, and be like oh do you recognize that one as people pass by he, he wanted that validation so badly uh i thought that was just one of the saddest things i'd ever heard so i was like i want i want to make that into a full um kind of ice cream man story and so that became the third issue that was based around a uh houstonian article yeah it's so awesome like are you i i would think me may, maybe it's not tiring but are you constantly like overly paying attention to little things that are happening around you hoping that you find a story in that or is that too deep and maybe it's not even that close i, I don't know it kind of goes in and out i mean sometimes i have you know these really grand ideas where i'm like yes we're going to do this thing and it's going to be this very specific homage and stylistic thing and it's going to very specifically play with this message and ask these questions um and other times you know i kind of start from a, a very mundane place and the story sort of builds on itself um and that's i think all writers would probably attest to that that you know once you get uh kind of into the nitty-gritty of the notebook and trying to build out and flesh out your story uh it start it can start taking turns that you didn't expect even if you have these very specific plans for them yeah, yeah man i just i think the the last one that i just reread right now because it again very kind of sad um but it's the tele telethon telethon yeah uh, <laughs> they're constantly trying to raise money for him because he's died yeah. and, and he, he does. doesn't he doesn't understand that he's the the subject of a telethon exactly and and th those are one of those ones that after you read it like later in the day you start to think about you know am i are there things about me that is that is I don't know, dying is kind of a maybe a, an exaggeration but i think we all have that experience where we go through things and there's an ending to that experience and then you move on to another thing and then there's an ending to that experience but there's death constantly right because those feelings die and then you move on to the next one right. After reading that i started thinking about 
all these different things that are taking place in my life. And is there someone trying to raise money for me too? <laughs> Just because sometimes you don't have a great day, right? And <laughs> maybe you need that. A lot, lot, lot of days. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm no, you know, I mean, ideas are a dime a dozen and so many of us have kind of the same ideas and a lot of it isn't about the idea. It's about the execution and the, the will to see an idea from nothing to something. And, and that's really where creation comes in. But I often see things that we've done echoed years later in modern pop culture that, that show jury duty. Yeah. I haven't seen it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, this idea that a guy is in a full on show of a show that he doesn't, he doesn't know, you know? Um, and I, and I heard, I read about that guy. I haven't seen the show. I know James Marsden's in it. But that I, I read an article about James Marsden about what a nice guy he is because the the subject of that show will still have kind of freakouts like like what's real like am I done is it done are we back to real life now and James Marsden James Marsden will calm him down and be like yeah dude the cameras are off like we're sleeping like it's over don't worry um, but that's like you know that idea is kind of what telethon was is that you're you're walking around and um, you're the, you're this star of a show. There are commercial breaks. There are ads. You know, there's everything. Yeah, the ads are pretty funny too. Now, uh, when you're doing something like that, where you have this story and you're able to kind of throw in ads like that, because you do that in other stories too, is that kind of a fun break for you to be able to do something kind of fun like that in the midst of maybe a, a story that has a a more deep meaning to it? I think so. Yeah, it's, it's it's become especially fun because a lot of the commercials or ads or um, little callouts are now callbacks. You know, the, it's usually not for something new. It's for something that uh, has already appeared somewhere in Ice Cream Man canon. And you know, and we're very very strict about the fact that you don't have to read any single one of our issues to be part of the party. Um, you know, you should be able to pick up any single issue and enjoy it as its own thing. And you don't have to commit to our series as, you know, uh, a pull box or read from in a certain order or anything like that. Um, but for those that are along for the ride, we do like to reward people. And so those like commercials and little um, product placements and things like that are kind of uh the little treats that we give to people that have uh, been doing this with us since the beginning of the ride. That's so fun. I love it, man. And then uh, can we talk a little bit about Mark Martin and his art? Because after you read Ice Cream Man, you can't go back and imagine anybody else doing the art for this. Like his artistic style works so good for the storytelling that is taking place within, within this. Um, you said that you had worked with him before on Art Brute. Was that the first time you met him through Art Brute? Yeah, so I was, um, I had had like a, an OGN come out at IDW and was looking for an artist for this art history idea that I had. Uh, but it was kind of like a, it was a, one of these pitches that was sort of hard to explain to an artist. Like, oh, you're going to have to, um, you're going to have to superimpose the Mona Lisa. Then you're going to have to draw what it looks like inside the Mona Lisa <laughs> um, as well. And like, you know, uh, parts of the Mona Lisa that we can't see, you get to expand and, and, and draw, you know, what's, what's in the far corner off screen that we can't see. And, and how does that world work and stuff like that. Um, Martine was one of a handful of artists that I approached for that project. And he was, he got it immediately. Um, and uh, yeah, we just kind of hit the ground running. Unfortunately, we had to change the name of the book when it came out um, for silly reasons. Um, but I I came up with pretty much the world's worst title as a replacement. Uh, it was called The Electric Sublime is what it came out as. Um, and yeah, four issues, you know, probably four to five readers in total. Um, uh, but we got the rights back and Eric at Image was really nice to let us re-release it as Art Brute with new 
covers and new backup stories and now it's in this really beautiful hardcover collection nice uh, but that but that was that was me meeting martin and then when uh art brute electric sublime whatever you want to call it was done we you know we weren't signed with anybody we had no nothing going but we had just started to really kind of hit our stride working together we were like oh i get you and i get i get your work process and i can see how you think and put an issue together uh, it's a big part of the comic making process is you know you learn everyone's got a different collaboration style um and so you're constantly sort of recalibrating your own to fit who you're working with uh, but martin and i kind of our natural styles are exactly um complementary to each other um so we were like yeah we just got to keep working on stuff together and now we've made you know uh, i think he just threw drew what was the thousandth page of ice cream man comic he's drawn over a thousand pages of of this story of this world so, that's amazing congratulations that's huge uh thanks yeah and he's just um you know uh it's weird because we are you know a, a quote-unquote popular book but we're but we, we kind of live on the fringes and in the spotlight at the same time it's like some people know we're a really popular book and our numbers you know we, we do pretty well for for the modern comic market um, but we're also also at the same time like a niche book and have like a cult following um so like not everyone knows who martin is but they should because he's one of the best working artists in comics right now. I mean, he's just so good. Um, and I have been been lucky enough to kind of grab him off of the the bench um, for the past six to eight years, basically. <laughs> That's amazing. And then you're jumping right into Swan Songs, and he is one of the many artists um, that have participated in that. Can you kind of talk a bit about uh swan songs uh a little bit about what your your process was around the storytelling that takes place in there and the usage of all these amazing artists for each story sure so swan songs is actually the second book of its kind in terms of my uh catalog you know my resume um i had a book come out maybe two to three years ago called haha -ha. um and actually uh, ha, ha and so the diff the I wanted to write separate individual you know so my thing in comics is that I'm the one shot guy I don't write ongoing uh, narratives I uh, I don't know how um, if you you know forced me to to write six issues that all you know kind of tell a story together from one to six I, I'm not sure I'd be able to do it um, but I've you know uh, kind of uh, worked on these muscles of of compression and um, one shot storytelling, they they call it or whatever, um, one and done, whatever. Um, and so, haha, -ha, which came out was six one shots, uh, each about different professional clowns. Um, and issue one, issue one was by by Vanessa Del Rey. Uh, issue two was by Zoe Thorogood, who has become her own sort of um, you know the, this phenom of, of comics. Issue three was uh, a silent issue by Roger Langridge, a classic cartoonist. Uh, issue four was by uh, Pat Horvath, who now has his own sort of um, highly regarded book at IDW. I think it's IDW called like um, Beneath the Trees Where Nobody oh. Sees. Yeah, yeah. It's sold. Um, they're like on their third printing. I think it only has two issues out. Yeah, issue five was done by Gabriel Walta. And it's like one of the, I think one of the most beautiful things he's ever done. And then issue six is actually in that pink collection behind you. Um, uh, ha Ha number six is a tie-in to I, the world of Ice Cream Man. Yeah. Um, it calls back to a character you see in Ice Cream Man issue eight. Um, happy Hank, the very happy clown. Is his yeah, name. yeah, um, yeah. Very end. Yeah. So the that was the first time I did like a thing like that. Um, and so when I was coming up with Swan Songs, which were all one shots about things ending, yeah. I was like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do the same shtick where the last issue is an Ice Cream Man tie-in. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, cool, man. And so, uh, yeah, so the last issue, so Swan Songs are all one shot, six one shots about things ending. The uh, first one's about the end of the world. It was drawn by Martin Simmons from the Department of Truth. Uh, issue two is the end of a marriage, drawn by Casper Wingard, um, Homesick Pilots. Issue three is the end of the end of the world, uh, drawn by F Felipe Andrade, uh, who, who does work uh, with like Ram V, uh, I think is his name, like Rare Flavors. And um, issue four was the end of a sentence and that was done by caitlin yarsky and it had all these like um uh mad libs in them that i got to make which were really fun uh issue five was the end of anadonia which was done in full collage by this guy named alex ekman who's never drawn a comic before wow. um and then issue six is with team ice cream man and is a play on shell silver scenes where the sidewalk ends uh, and it's called uh, The End of the Sidewalk, and it's an Ice Cream Man tie-in. Um, and it's all these, it's got, it's got some real comics in it, but the story is told largely by these kind of very dark poems. Um, uh, so I've, I've basically done two miniseries and did the same shtick in both of them, where the last issue, uh, I get to work with the people I'm most comfortable with, and they tie into this larger world uh, you know, that we've been creating together for over six years. It sounds like a lot of fun. I can't wait to get my hands on that. Um, oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's incredible. And, and I love that kind of one shot. Because, you know, obviously I love DC. I love Marvel. I love a lot of uh, um, comics where you do, right? They're, they're longer stories. They're like six issues, eight issues for an arc. And then you start a new arc. And those are great. But to be able to just go in and read something from beginning to end and then walk away knowing that you have the whole story. There is something attractive about that. I think as a reader of comic books, um, it's probably one of the many reasons why uh, your, your writing style is so popular is because people can come in and come out whenever they want. And they're always going to get a full story and something that probably is going to be a tattoo in their brain <laughs> for a long time. Oh, thank you. Yeah. A lot of that, a lot of that goes to my reading, which is um, I'm, I've, I'm a big short story reader, always have been. So uh, Dennis Johnson, George Saunders, Grace Paley, uh, Raymond Carver, uh, Ernest Hemingway's shorter stuff, uh, 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 Donald Barth Barthelme, I, I could go on and on. But I, basically the way I learned to read was through the short story. And so a lot of the ways that I learned to write was through the compression and the economics of a short story. You know, you have to really do a lot of heavy lifting and a lot of hard work in a small amount of space. And so you have to be very efficient and make very clear choices. You know, not, nothing can be wasted, no panel, no throwaway dialogue. You really want each one to kind of hit hit you in the face. And so it, it raises the stakes as you're writing, like, oh, like, I'm not just going to you know, whittle my, diddle my way through a script. Like I want each panel to be something that is essential to the story that if you were to take it away, it, the story would somehow be lessened. Um, so it's, it's just the way I learned to write basically. Um, but, uh, and again, um, I keep, I, I get offers to write like ongoing stuff. And I was, my answer is always, I, I don't know how. So um Maybe I should learn how someday. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I love writing one shots and that's going to be what I write for the foreseeable future. Yeah, I mean, as as kind of a, a DC Marvel fan, man, you doing like a just a one shot on Swamp Thing or something like that would be really unique, I think, with your style of uh, storytelling. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I get it. And you're really good in that, in that area. So why mess around with this other area? I think you're doing all right on, on, uh, the short stories. I think, I think I'm allowed to say this. I didn't like sign like an NDA or anything, but I, I've had a lot of these things at both Marvel and DC that just haven't worked out. Um, and I kind of stopped trying to make them work out because they never do. And there's always some weird compromise that happens at the end. And, um, you know, I uh, don't have a ton of time to like 
work on a bunch of stuff only to see it kind of be thrown out the window. But uh, my most recent one, and I was very close to becoming a reality, was that I always wanted to do a one-shot follow-up to All-Star Superman um, about Leo Quintum, um, who is this kind of mad scientist doctor that only you know exists in the world of All-Star Superman. Um, and there is a whole script uh, uh, written for DC um, about Leo revisiting some of the worlds that Superman uh, visited before he flew into the sun in All-Star Superman and has its own twists and turns and little things. But um, ultimately, DC, I think, decided decided that if someone was going to do it, it should be Grant Morrison. And my my argument was, well, could you just ask for permission? And they were like, no, not really. So um, I was like, okay, I guess this this thing is over then. But you know, we had paperwork and people signed on to do it and variant cover. I mean, it was it was a real thing. And then that that's how how this business works. Like it could all go away very quickly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's unfortunate. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did you uh, did you grow up uh, reading a lot of superhero style comic books, or was that never kind of your thing? Yeah, I would say I wouldn't say a lot, but I, I did read superhero style comic books. I I read comics my whole life, on and off. Uh, I mean, I was more attracted to just like standard prose and novels and stuff. Um, but when I was in high school and then going into college, I started to kind of you know get into all the British guys that you know, impressed everyone. In the, and again, this was, they were before my time, but they were still, um, and this was part of it is because of the explosion of things like Borders and Barnes and Noble. And um, I had all these great on-campus places where I could get books and comics. Um, you know, so uh, Grant Morrison, Alan Moore, Neil Gaiman, uh, these people who have written these these works, these comics works that have stood the test of time. Um, and then I also, I was very lucky to work under um, this woman um, during college who, she's pretty much like the most famous comics scholar um, that really? exists, which, you know, uh, doesn't, to most people doesn't mean anything, but um, she like co-wrote a book with Art Spiegelman called Meta Mouse. Um, she was my professor for for a couple of semesters and kind of introduced me to all of these nonfiction comics which became my favorite kind of comic so um Alison Bechdel's work and Phoebe Glockner and then like the more um like Daniel Klaus like uh kind of towing that line between autobiography and fake and all that sort of stuff um and then Joe Sacco who, who did like you know I wish Joe Sacco was doing work now. He did like foreign reportage in in comics form in like Palestine and Jordan. And um, we could, I think, really use his voice right now from what's going on over there. But, um, but yeah, so the mixture of all that stuff of having the, the general interest in superhero comics and then learning to love Morrison and Moore and Gaiman and then also learning to love... Um, these more serious kind of nonfiction comics and then an abiding love for just literature in general all throughout, like all just kind of mixed to create whatever the heck it is. My, my style is. Yeah. I love it, man. I love it. Yeah. You definitely have a very unique uh, style that uh, I absolutely love, man. That the, the way that your stories come forth are just incredible. Um, I don't know how, thank you so much. Yeah, no, a huge fan of uh, everything that you're doing. And I can't wait for uh, Swan Songs just to read those short stories, man. I, I love those little bursts of stories where you can walk away and you can think about it. Um, because I do, I you know, I love Green Lantern and some of these other ones. And they're great stories. Uh, Jeremy Adams is on uh, Green Lantern right now. He's a great writer. Love him. One of my favorite writers. But you're invested, right? And then you read the story. And I got to wait four weeks to hit the rest of the story. You know, it's just the way comic books work. But I love going into Ice Cream Man. And, you know, for 15 minutes, I can read that story. And I can think about it all day uh, because it has all kinds of applications usually, um, which is fun you know it's it's kind of nice to read something that makes you think about things and consider things and not everything has that impact right yeah and you know, and i know our book 
can is kind of considered it can be a bummer or too serious or um and i'm okay with that um you know i kind of i, I write what i'm interested in the issue 39 which won't come out until probably like may i guess um is actually all about what you just said about um writing something and then having to wait for the story to conclude um it's about um decompression um uh and it's actually two issues we're calling it a two-parter but you don't have to read either part to understand um the the story but they're actually two two issues that connect to each other and the the covers actually connect to and create a, a big a big image but um it's all about that about like well do you have to tell the story um in this amount of space like do you have to uh, what, what i call kick the can down the road um or can you just finish it can you choose to you know really rivet someone from start to finish in just the 28 pages and not have to leave the cliffhanger and the you know, we've all been there when you're reading a, an ongoing series and you're reading through materials like, oh, this is just time wasting. This is just like spinning the wheels until we get to the next thing that we're supposed to get to. And um, we try to avoid that in Ice Cream Man as much as we can. It definitely comes across. <laughs> definitely. Now, there's been rumors about either a live action or maybe an animated series of Ice Cream Man. Is there any new news as to whether we could see like a, a almost like a Twilight Zone type series where maybe we get one of your episodes uh, every so often in live action? What's the, what's the best way that I can put this? <laughs> I've... I am not allowed to say anything, okay, yeah. but there is very big news. Okay, that's I'll, I'll, that's, I'll leave, be, leave it at that. That's I think that will make a lot of people happy. That's that's plenty of uh, information um, and news that that might actually surprise some people a little, um, a little different than what they might have had in mind. So it's 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 really cool. We're all super happy, but again, I'm not really allowed to yeah, yeah. To, to talk about it. So. Understood. I, you know, it, it would be weird if it wasn't that way with you, to be honest, right? There should be some sort of like, yeah, it's going to be like this. And then we're like, holy crap, it's not even close to what we thought it would be. I think that would uh, fit everything that you do very well. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, that's a really great way to put it. I didn't even really think about that, but it, it is really true <laughs> to how our book has gone, where the way this has ended up, um, it's just different. <laughs> um and uh we're 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 thrilled i hope soon i can say more about it um but uh i'm not not in charge of those things unfortunately understood <clears throat> excuse me understood yeah well let me give it some water real quick <clears throat> i'll cut this part uh, out uh, i'll do the same <clears throat> i made a mistake uh eating triscuits before I got on, which weirdly I love. It's like an old people snack, but I love them, but they right. make it really dry. <laughs> yeah, you should just down a down a sleeve of saltines before every podcast and see if you could get through the whole thing without a sip of water. Yeah, exactly. I couldn't do it with the Triscuits, so I'm not sure I could do it with saltines. So, I think that's a comic right there, just a saltine on each page. Um, <laughs> you can make that guy. work. You can make that work, man. <laughs> yeah. I love it, man. So, you know, with Swan Songs, is there anything else that you have going on um, over the next year so that you're able to share comic book related? Or is Swan Songs really kind of the newest thing that we should get excited about, which will hit your local comic book store March 13th? Um, So you just have to go to your comic book uh, store and tell them to order Swan Songs if they haven't already. Yeah, so the issues have already come out, but the, you know, the collection, like you said, um, Hits, hits in March, um, and we would love for people to read that. Um, and then for 2024 specifically, I am focusing solely on Ice Cream Man, um, both uh, just to get more issues out, tell more Ice Cream Man stories, which is my favorite thing to do, and then hopefully also um, have a little bit more of this information that starts to uh, come out for the other fun stuff. So it is a, an Ice Cream Man year of 2024. I love it. I love it. How can I just ask um, from a planning standpoint, 
how far out are you working? Like if issue 38 is coming out, are you already on like 41, 42, 43, somewhere in there? Like where's that comfortableness with you on being kind of ahead of the game? Yes, I mean, you know, comics in general, the solicitations come out, what, three months in advance of the actual release. Uh, so you really have to be about five or six months ahead in terms of your writing and your production, you know, making sure the pages are drawn. Um, that's a pretty comfortable spot for us. I mean, I, I'm i very lucky in that Martin um, Marazzo and Chris O'Halloran, our colorist from Ireland, uh, can work very quickly. So if I'm like late on a script, um, they still hit their dates and don't compromise anything. Awesome. Um, which is basically the case right now. I, I was supposed to hand them the script two days ago. Um, and I just I haven't been able to get it to them. Um, but yeah, you work about five or six months out, which winds up being about four or five issues out. For Ice Cream Man specifically, I think in in blocks of four. So the you have the the the, the deluxe hardcovers behind you, um, but the paperbacks that come out um, more frequently each have four issues in them. Okay. Um, so once I finish issue 40, which will be what I'm writing after I finish up this current script, I will then start to consider 41 through 44 kind of as, as a whole piece of, as a whole set of issues and be like, is there, do I just want to tell four separate stories? Do I want to try something new in this, in this space of four issues? Do I want them to connect a little bit? Um, which we've tried before and like the, um, in the, uh, I guess, issues nine through 12, uh, they were all like, it was called Hopscotch Melange, and they were all like different takes on a certain genre of story. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, so we, I, I think in groups of four, and so I'm always kind of four down the road, four down the road, four down the road. I love it, man. I love it. Well, W. Maxwell, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you making some time. I'm hoping we could have you back when you're able to share a little bit more news when you know things are being released and it's okay to talk about it. Because uh, I, I know myself and a, a lot of uh, my comic book nerds, that when we come together, we, we love reading your material and anything you write, man, I'm, I'm there for it. So I, I really appreciate it. And it's uh, an honor to talk to you, man. It's really so kind of you. Thank you so much. And hopefully, yeah, once you once you see that big headline you'll know that i'm allowed to open my mouth and hit me back up and i'll I'll come give you some more information i would love that man it's such a huge fan and i can't wait for uh the year of the ice cream man 2024 it sounds like it's gonna be a lot of fun awesome thank you so much man yeah i appreciate you and uh have a great rest of the week and feel free not to edit out the water drink we both drank water I know. I will. i'm gonna leave it i'm gonna leave people it people need to stay hydrated so <laughs> Exactly. It's fair, right? We all have to do that, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love it, man. W. Maxwell, cool. thank you so much, man. I really appreciate you. Be well. Enjoy your day. You too.